Good, well, good afternoon. Namaste, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see a few of you here. It's a long day, isn't it? It's been a busy day. I've seen lots of presentations, lots of busy stuff, talking to people, networking, eating, eating, eating some more. Sounds like a conference to me. So um, let's just take a few minutes to let go of the busyness of this morning and since lunch and just take a moment to just clear our minds and come into the room and be present. So let's just take a couple of breaths, just deep breath in and out. Clear your mind, let go of this morning. Another nice breath in, nice breath out. Just relax, clear your mind and be ready. So welcome. So my name's Kathy Burkage, I'm from Australia. I do a lot of Agile stuff. I've been doing Agile stuff since the early 90s when it wasn't really Agile officially. We had this crazy thing called rapid application design. I'm an engineer by background. Done lots of Agile stuff with all sorts of different versions and iterations of different forms of Agile, different roles in Agile. These days I do a lot of Agile training, a lot of Agile coaching. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. There's lots of really good Agilists out there, and yeah, I might be one of them, but that's not what my presentation's about. My presentation's about mindful Agile and the mindfulness aspect and how mindfulness really enables that Agile mindset. People might arrive now. So first, a little story about why mindfulness and why Agile and mindfulness. So about 20 years ago, my life changed in every way, shape, or way possible. Um, everything that I thought was a direction of my life changed completely. In a bad way, actually. I actually died. I died on an operating table. And they brought me back. But when I came back, I came back disabled. I went back to work, finally, after many months in hospital and I was not the same person. I was angry. I couldn't believe it happened to me. I had an attitude and a chip on my shoulder. And my boss at the time, the person who I am so grateful for because she was my greatest teacher, told me, Kathy, if you don't fix your attitude, get out. And I thought, the nerve. How dare she? How does she not understand what I've been through? How does she not understand how much pain I'm in? How can she not realise why I feel the way I am and I behave the way I am? So I went home outraged, ready to almost quit. A really good job, by the way. Really nice environment. It wasn't agile because it was the 1990s, right? No social then. <laughs> and I was project manager. <laughs> and uh, it just by chance happened that I saw a sign on my local shop that said, are you stressed? Are you angry? Are you anxious? Come to a three-day, $50, three-day, three-week mindfulness session 20 years ago. And I honestly say it hasn't changed my life, but it's changed how I am. And that's really the important thing to say. Some things are out of your control, but you certainly have control over who you are and how you behave, and that's the one thing that mindfulness taught me. Now, of course, I learnt mindfulness from Eastern religion. I studied the Vedas to start with, and I started the Dharma, so that's where my background comes from. And for many years, I always felt that there was such a connection with my practice and being in a team, working in the environment, working in corporate, and as the rise of Agile became more and more, since about 2000, I've been working more prominently in Agile, I realised that, well, to be agile, it's not about doing sprints and stand-ups and story points and velocity charts. We can all do that stuff, but it really takes a different mindset, and that mindset needs mindfulness to be aware of are we adopting the right mindset or are we not? And so myself, I sort of floated the idea, and I coach, so I do coach a few teams, and I found that not by saying anything specifically to my team, but I said, hey, how about we all just take a moment to do just like we did before, take a few breaths, clear our minds, 
and let's re-come to the problem. Let's re-come to the estimation session. Let's re-come to the story elaboration session. Let's re-come into the room to do this sprint plan or, more importantly, that retro. So that mindfulness really changed the way that some of my teams behaved. I thought, well, this is the thing that works. So I was doing it by stealth in teams and I thought, this, this works. And then I said, how about you join me in the morning? It's completely optional. Come and join me for a formal mindfulness session, which I tried and everybody loved it. First two people came, then a few more, then the whole team and then other people, other stakeholders came. And people found that they benefited from this as well. So I've been trying to introduce it and I say that I'm an agile coach but I'm also a mindfulness coach for that purpose. So that's a little bit of a background, a bit of a story. So I'm not here to talk too much about me. I want to talk about why I think there's certainly a huge connection between mindfulness and, and agile. So let's start with what is mindfulness? Anybody here practice mindfulness? A few of us, a little bit. So you all know how easy it is and so everyday and <laughs> difficult it can be. So um, when you go and investigate mindfulness, you'll see that there are so many definitions, so many different flavours and ways of I explaining it. So there's not one complete version. I find that mindfulness, when I read more about it, and again, I've, I've come from mindfulness from experience, not from studying, so I'm just picking up what's out there. Um, there's a lot of aspects to it. So the first aspect, really, mindfulness is a quality of complete awareness without judgments, without perception. Now let's think about that for two seconds. Without judgments and perceptions, the human mind doesn't work that way. Think about lunch. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Judgment, right? How many of you actually experienced it without that judgment? I like, I dislike. I like her clothes, I don't like his. We're constantly doing it. We like or we dislike or we're neutral all day, every day. Our mind is constantly judging based on perception, based on filters, based on everything that we've come from in our culture, in our families, in our workplaces. We're a product of our past and they cloud the way we think and they give us those glasses that we see the world through with these judgments and perceptions. So mindfulness is actually dropping them all and seeing things as they are without all those judgments that get in the way. So that's one aspect of mindfulness. The next aspect of mindfulness is simply deliberate attention. Deliberately paying attention to what is here. Now that also sounds easy, but actually we are time travellers. All day, every day, we time travel. We're back in the past rehashing past instances, past incidents, personal or work. We're travelling back to the past and reliving it, rehashing it, reinterpreting it, re-evaluating it, re-judging it, and perhaps it's forming more perceptions about what's going to cloud our future. And if we're not travelling backwards, we're travelling forwards. What's going to happen tomorrow, tonight, next week, next month, next year? So we're constantly time travelling. How many of us are, really, are we really here experiencing the now without thinking about tomorrow or tonight or the next session or dinner tonight? <laughs> so deliberate attention to what's now is meaning we stop that time travel aspect. Sounds easy, right? It's not. It's very difficult. So deliberate attention, I also use the analogy which um, one of the great mindfulness um, teachers at the moment, uh, a lovely guy called Dan Siegel. He's got a lot, a lot of um, the, the literature I've been reading and I've done some workshops with Dan. He um, talks about this deliberate attention and he uses the analogy of walking into a dark room. So imagine you've walked into your house and it is pitch black, you can't see anything. You're walking into your lounge room, can't see a thing. But you have a flashlight in your hand. And when you turn on the flashlight, you can direct the beam of light to anywhere you like in your house. You can move to a painting, a chair, a table, the TV, the bench, a rug. You can direct that torch light to wherever you want in the room, deliberately, by moving the light. Well, deliberate attention is the same thing within our mind. 
We can choose what we do or don't focus on. We can direct that beam of light of awareness, that attention to wherever we want. So deliberate attention is deliberately saying, I'm going to shine the light of my attention on this subject, on this thing, that concentration and focus. So it's not about being all la-la and, you know, sitting and gazing in navel. It's really an intense state of mind, of full concentration and awareness. Another aspect is really being open and present. Now, open and present sounds like, yeah, yeah, we're all open and present, but we're not. I don't want this to happen. I'm not open to things happening. <laughs> we're not really here half the time. So we really want to be objectively ready to accept what's here. It's radical acceptance, really, about what is in front of me now and seeing it clearly. So there's some aspects of mindfulness. Um, the other way I like to think about mindfulness is the opposite of mindfulness, which is what I call mindlessness. And I guarantee you, you can all, you've all experienced it. So the two classic examples I find happen, when you're driving to work, you're driving along, and you get to work, and you go, I don't remember driving here. Or my favorite, I'm sitting down to a delicious meal and I'm so carried away with my thoughts. Next thing you know, I look down, there's an empty plate. Who ate my dinner? I did, but I don't remember anything about it. I didn't taste it, I didn't experience it whatsoever. So this mind-wandering state, this mindlessness state, is actually what we all are in, scientists say, about 47% of the time we're in this mind-wandering state. How's that productivity going at work, right? 47% mind-wandering, not focused not being present. So being mindful is reducing that mind-wandering, mindlessness state and really being here. There's also a lot of misconception that mindfulness is about getting rid of thoughts and getting rid of emotions. It's absolutely not the case. It's about shining the awareness on those thoughts and those emotions to be able to direct our energies in a more wise and more calm way by bringing attention to what's really happening and then deliberately choosing how we're going to use that, being wiser with our choices. When we think of knee-jerk reactions, you know, you get hit by the doctor's hammer and you have that automatic reflex. Well, we all have that in our thoughts too. We feel something, an emotion, a feeling comes up and before we know it, we've blurted out something. We've chosen to react like a knee-jerk reaction. Now, we're all walking around because we're not mindfully one observing what's going on. But with mindfulness, we can feel it, become aware. Hmm, I'm not happy with that. So before I react without pausing, I, that mindfulness allows me to observe, hang on, how can I choose my response more clearly, more calm, more wise, rather than knee-jerk being swept away with the emotion how many of you have ever blurted out something in the heat of the, at work or at home and gone, I wish I'd taken that back? Because we haven't been mindful. We've just kind of let our emotions run over us. There is science behind all that. Science is hard. I'll leave that to the scientists, but I can assure you there's a lot of science behind it. So how do we do mindfulness? Well, there's two types. The first type is the informal practice or the day-by-day, moment-by-moment experience of mindfulness which sounds really easy, but it's not. So it's that coming back, just coming back to your breath like we did, letting go of thoughts, coming back with clarity, dropping, and just refocusing and resetting. Sounds easy, right? But very quickly, a thought comes, a distraction comes, and next thing you know, we've gone away, we're off on a tangent, and we are not mindful anymore. So mindfulness brings us back, snaps us back to the awareness of the now. So we can do that all day, every day. It's not special. It's a natural and neutral way of, of, um, of our mind. It's available to us 24 by 7, 365 days a year. No software, hardware, or anything else required. It is available to you all the time. It's just a question of remembering to come back and be mindful and not letting the mind wander and get lost on those tangents. 
So that's the informal practice. But you can see I've got my bodybuilder here because to do well in the informal day-by-day -day practice, we've got to go to the gym, we've got to do the formal practice, the mind training, which is, of course, meditation. Simplest and the hardest thing to do at the same time. So how many of you go to the gym? <laughs> I used to be a gym instructor too, once upon a time. Um, so do you go to the gym to be good at the gym? Not usually. Most people go to the gym because they want to look good outside the gym or they want to be faster in their sport of choice. So people go to the gym to train to be better outside the gym. And when we think about mindfulness practice and meditation, it's the same thing. You don't go and do meditation to become a good meditator. You do meditation to be better in your everyday life and be more mindful. So it's like a workout for your mind. You get stronger and stronger, so by becoming and doing meditation formally, it's that gym workout, so when you're outside the gym, when you're outside of meditation, you're more able to be more mindful in your day-to-day -day practice. So it is a workout for the brain. A lot of people think it's all peace and relaxation. Well, that's not meditation. Meditation is single-pointed concentration and forcing your mind to stay on subject and stay on track. It's not though it's so easy. So some of you have already done this before. Are you all ready to give it a go? The day-to-day -day 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 mindfulness, you do, it's up to you to do. But the formal stuff, I'm going to read, uh, walk you through because most people find that you need someone to help you get used to doing meditation. So we're going to do a quick one together. Now, before we start, I'm just going to walk you through what it means and then we'll do it. So I'll just do a bit of instruction first before we start. So the number one instruction always is to relax. It's not something special. You don't. Not a special thing, it's open and everybody can do it. So relax and be kind to yourself because perhaps when you first start to meditate, you finally realise how much your mind is just jumping around like a monkey. So be kind to yourself. It's, you're going to have thoughts, you're going to have distractions. I guarantee you, after 20 years, I think I'm starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> Some days are better than ever. And the goal, remember, is not to be good at meditation. That is not the goal. The goal is to become more aware of what's happening. So when we meditate, we sit comfortably. Um, we rest our hands comfortably in our laps now. Depending on what you've seen, you might see people with their ankles behind their ears and all sorts of crazy mudras. Fine if that's comfortable for you. But I just find not too slouchy, not too straight, but something just nice and somewhere comfortable for your hands and your legs, typically uncrossed legs if you're sitting on a seat because if you're sitting like I do for sometimes eight hours or three days, you don't want anything that's going to become a real pain to distract you. Most people close their eyes, but as you get better, you might learn to open your eyes. But not, not a beginner's tool, but certainly closing your eyes helps. Then we come to clearing our mind, bringing all our focus and attention to the one thing, and for this we're just going to do our breath meditation which will be let's focus all our attention on just the breath. Then the next instruction is simple. Don't let your thoughts disrupt you. Don't follow your thoughts. When a thought comes, and I guarantee you it's when, and it'll be very quick, a thought will come. Am I doing this right? I can hear a noise. What is she saying? The person next to me is moving. There's movement around me. Don't follow the thought. Let it go gently and bring your attention back to the breath. So when we talk about focusing on the breath, it's about the sensation of breathing, whether it's through the nose, through the mouth, through your chest, and we just focus all our thought and attention on just that one thing. And when you're distracted, the goal is of meditation is to notice that you've been distracted, notice that a thought has come, notice that you've been taken away, and the goal of meditation is to be good at bringing yourself back to the point of awareness, which is the breath. So are we ready to do it? This is the time I go to my phone because I would go for half an hour, but I don't think that's what you've come for. All right, so I know what time it is. So let's get started. Find a nice comfortable position in your chair. Not too straight, not too slouch, comfortable hands. Close your eyes and most people find it's helpful to just gently bring the head down to a slightly lower gaze. 
take a deep breath in and just clear your mind. And then just simply bring all your focus and attention to the sensation of just your breath. Breathing in. And breathing out. Nothing more, nothing special. Just breathing. Just simply noticing the breath entering and leaving. Breathing in, just aware of the movement of the air entering the nose or the mouth, cool, fresh. Breathing out, just notice the breath leaving again, slightly warmer, preparing for the next breath. Each breath is different, no need to alter it in any way, it's natural, we do it all day long, now we're just paying attention to just breathing. Breathe in, breathe out, relax, focus, just breathing. If a thought comes or a sound happens, that's okay, let it go. And just gently bring your attention back to the breath. Breathing in, simple breathing in. Breathing out, simply just breathing out, nothing more. Don't let that distraction take you away from the object of your awareness. Come back to that breath. Bring your awareness to the breath. Notice how it feels in your chest. Rising, falling. Breathing in. Breathing out, focus, concentrate. Distractions come, let them go gently, come back to the breath. Notice each breath coming in, leaving, going out. Okay, take another deep breath in. Breathe out, and when you're ready, come back to the room and open your eyes when you're ready. I don't hear any snoring, that's a good sign. <laughs> if, you need, if you do fall asleep, you probably need it, you're probably tired, that's fine, it happens. But it just shows you that you're not actually being aware and you're not concentrating when you are sleeping because the process of going to sleep is actually a mind-wandering and mindlessness state. 
So mindfulness is actually bringing so, so single-pointed concentration that it happens. It happens. Sometimes you can't get your mind to stay still and stay on subject. Anybody have difficulty staying on track? I'm expecting everybody to have their hand up unless you're my guru. I really don't see how it wouldn't because it doesn't take long. Um, there's a whole heap of different meditations. There's about 84,000 different ones. This is just the, 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 the basic one. There's so many different kinds and there's so many different ways of doing it. That's what I love about meditation, that this one might not be for you. Maybe the one about feeling the sensation of the body or maybe one that's counting or maybe one that's got mantras in it. For those who do the mantras, I, I like mantra meditation myself because mantra meditation is not about reciting mantras, is it? It's about focus once again. So find the object that works for you. So there's a little taste of meditation and by being... Being, um, by practicing meditation, you're building up that muscle to bring that awareness and mindfulness into your day. And that's what we're here for. So let's uh, talk a little bit. Um, so first things first, there are lots of benefits. Today in the world, there are more than 5,000 scientifically researched peer-reviewed papers on the benefit of mindfulness, typically done by your Harvards and Yales and University of California in the psychology kind of medical departments. So that stuff's hard and that's scientific. I'll leave that good stuff to the people who got those, uh, those degrees. But there are significant benefits and don't take what's on here or the scientific um, papers as the benefits. Try it for yourself and see if it, you find benefits. If it benefits you, fabulous. It's cost you nothing. If it doesn't make any sense and you can't do it and it doesn't show any benefit to you, well, that's fine too. So don't take any papers or articles view, do it for yourself and see if you find benefit. And that's what I think is the most important research you can do. See for yourself. Sounds very agile already, right? So um, some of the benefits is not just peace and stress relief. While that is a major reason why people meditate, we also have a clear link now with um, clarity, calmness, better decision making, innovation and creativity, um, which we talk about of course, focus and concentration. And you think about focus and concentration in today's day where there's a distraction every second. Social, emails, people around you. So to be able to focus on the task at hand by being mindful as you choose, like that torch in the dark room, you can choose, I'm going to bring my awareness to what I'm doing here rather than being pinged to my phone, pinged to my email or whatever it is. I say, no, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to focus on this now. Um, it also helps communication and collaboration. I'm going to focus on that in the next part of my talk when we talk about Mindful Agile because if we're more aware of how we communicate, chances are we're going to collaborate and be in better in a team because that's what Agile is. You don't necessarily do Agile alone. Agile is a team sport, someone wise once told me. Um, and then the scientific research talks about blood pressure and immune response and all sorts of other things. So there's a lot of papers out there but you can research them. I'm going to put out some references at the end. So, agile mindset and mindfulness. So, mind, a mindset in this sense, the definition of a mindset is a set of attitudes or disposition, dispositions that are mental that predetermine your response to events and situations. That's what a mindset is. They predetermine. So what is this agile mindset that we hear so much about? What is these agile attitudes and dispositions that we're talking about with the agile mindset? Anybody like to call out what you know? Yep. Values, beliefs, principles of agile. Yep, so that's what's guiding our mindset, yes. So what are those elements? What are those attitudes that are in those values and principles? Can you call some of them out? Open to change, yes. Adaptability, absolutely. Learning, yes. Le learning from failure, exactly right. It's openness as well, transparency, collaboration. When I think of Agile, the first thing that comes into my head is collaboration and relationships with the people we're working with to achieve this shared and common goal. So when we talk about the Agile mindset, what we've just called out all need awareness because, hang on a minute, to be safe to fail. If we're not aware, maybe we 
get stuck in that perception and judgment and think, oh, how was that so wrong? And we get all hung up about it. We have to let it go. We have to be accepting. So let's look at agile, uh, mindful agile very briefly. Oops, wrong one for. So we all know about the Agile Manifesto, 18 years old. I do stir Kent Beck about what a beautiful Valentine's Day it must have been up there in uh, Snowbird because it was Valentine's Day when we were there. But um, so we know that we've got these values. And when we talk about values in this sense, it's not money value, it's a chosen concept that guides our behaviour. These values drive that mindset that tells us this is the way we should be reacting and responding. So they set those standards up for how we should be responding and working. So let's look at each one and the connection with mindfulness and why mindfulness helps us to really act on these values and have the right mindset. So the first one is individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Okay, fantastic. just a bit of a test there. So when we think of individuals and interactions, it's a people first thing. It's about relationships. It's about how we work together in a team. Now, if I'm not very aware of myself or my team, how's that going to work in my team dynamics if I'm just self-centred and not aware of what's going on? So mindfulness can say, let's drop what I think's going on and let's really check in. What's really happening in this team? Communication and collaboration really need to be effective. We need that mindfulness because when we think of communication, we have to adapt our style of communicating to them to suit the receiver. And then the receiver has an equal part to listen and not be distracted and not listen, which happens a lot of the time. We don't really listen. To listen properly, to listen to what's really being said, you need to co concentrate and focus, which is a mindfulness practice, to say, I'm going to listen to you and suspend that inner voice. That's a mindfulness practice, that inner voice, you know, that chatter, 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 all day long, that gets in the way of real listening. So mindfully listening will enhance that communication and you know that collaboration needs good communication. And to collaborate means that we have a shared and common goal, which means I dropped my judgments and my perceptions about my goal and think about the team. It's not just a group of people reporting to the same manager, it's about a group of people with a shared purpose. That means we've got to be mindful as, am I following that purpose or am I following my purpose? So we have to bring mindfulness into that. Um, resilience and well-being, well, to have these relationships, we need to be able to fail and learn and we can be wrong. And that can really demoralise people. So being mindful, we let go of all that and say, let's move on and start something new with fresh eyes, fresh clarity, without holding on to these things that could prevent resilience, you know, prevent us being a resilient in the face of failure or, or learning, because it can be quite challenging. And then, um, very briefly, I'm not going to go on about EQ and emotional intelligence, but you've all heard about EQ, emotional intelligence. Well, mindfulness is an underpinning foundation between, of emotional intelligence, because emotional intelligence is all about awareness, awareness of self and regulating yourself and your own reactions and regulating your own emotions, as well as recognising those in others. So mindfulness and awareness is really needed to be able to bring awareness in and build relationships through emotional intelligence because the more emotionally intelligent you are, chances are you're going to have better bonding relationships. So we need to stop every day and think what's going on with these aspects. Working software over... Comprehensive oh, come on, there's no docker on Agile, we know that. Okay, so um, when we talk about working software, working, what does working mean? Now, working for me is value. Not just, oh, is it bug free? So, yes, there's a quality aspect, but there's a value aspect. So when we're thinking about awareness and mindfulness, when we're thinking about working software, we ask, is this really valuable? Is it really valuable for me to gold plate these lines of code or to do that extra testing when we've got deadlines we want to give it to the customer to learn and experiment? So we have to focus on what is value. Um, we also need to think about mental clarity. We want innovation. How many of you have got the task of innovate? Get me innovation. Well. Innovation means we've got to think differently. We've got to let go of the way of doing things. We've got to try something new. So holding on to old memories and perceptions is not going to innovate for us. 
So mindfully, we clear our mind and open ourselves up to the new, new possibilities, new ways of thinking, so we can create better, innovative, valuable products. Then we've got a purpose, our sense of meaning. Because when we think about value in terms of quality and customer or business value, they give us a sense of purpose that can drop our own perceptions and our own judgments getting in the way and say we're focusing on that. And the last one there is, of course, um, as I mentioned, awareness and innovation. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So this one's quite a hard one when people sort of, when I talk about um, what does this value really mean. So I'm just going to focus on customer and inclusion. And it's dropping the, hmm, if I was the customer, I would do it this way. How many of you think that all day, every day? Oh, the customer would want this. Hmm, we're projecting our own thoughts, likes, dislikes onto that customer because that's the way we would want it. So we've got to bring that mindfulness and say, is this really what the customer would value or is it what I think I value? So when we think of inclusion and really being true empathy and focusing on delight, what would really make the customer sing? So continuous learning and discovery, being resilient in the face of failure. We say it's safe to fail, but then we fail and then we, we go on about it and in our minds, oh, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe they did that, round and round we go. That's not mindfulness, that's time travelling, mulling things over, you've got to let it go. You've got this acceptance of, all right, that's it, what do we learn, let's move forward now. And mindfulness allows us to move forward with and snap away from those thought processes that keep us trapped in the past. So it's objective insight. And of course, the last one is my favourite, following, uh, following a plan. Responding to change over following a plan. So this one is a classic. Anybody here ever travelled and had some sort of disruption to your travel? Flight delays, flight cancellations, missed the train, missed the connection? Yeah? Responding to change. How do you feel when that happens when you're travelling? Ah, my flight's cancelled. My flight got cancelled, actually, yesterday. So I now have to find a whole new flight back, to, back home. But that's okay. So in our day-to-day -day life, when we have change, quite often it is a point of misery. We get stressed, we get upset, we go, ah. We don't go with that change, do we? We fight the change. I wish it was this way. And then my mind goes on and on and on about why, 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 why. That's not responding to change. That's getting stuck in the past. So we have to look forward and say, oh, well, now we've got this situation, let's go with it. Because plans change. The only certainty in life is change. So we've got to, of course, accept it. And that means mindfully letting go of what we thought was going to happen and say, this is the new reality now. So it takes a practice to snap us out and that's this day-to-day -day stuff. Now, when I think about myself as a, a coach, it's about prompting people. As an agile coach, many of you agile coaches, it's about prompting people, okay, let's let go. And getting someone to bring you back and snap you back into that concentrate on the new way forward. Flexibility, openness, willingness to drop the old and come with the new. And of course, inclusive decision-making, which means oh, we don't just have one person's decision, we all have to hear. So, uh, we now have uh, just a quick few minutes left. So, when we think of practices and Agile, I've put six common Agile practices up there. And each of them you can practice mindfulness with in the informal way. So, when we're thinking about in a sprint, that two to four week period, we need to consider what are we focusing on? things that are valuable, so we can focus continuously on value. And that's what you should be constantly thinking. And we need to think about value and, of course, what's happening in my work and what am I focusing on, what's happening in my team's work and how can I help them. So that's a day-by-day -day activity. Can't really see it there. Sprint planning. The one I really want to focus there is the last drop point, generosity. I'm going to help you. I can take on that. I can contribute to that. I'm a bit quiet this time. I can be mindfully aware 
with my contribution to the team. So we can constantly come to our sprint plan, start openly and say, how can we create value in this sprint? How can we be generous to help each other? It's a team, not just me, it's a team. So really caring for the team so we can achieve our objectives. And focusing on that mindfully by dropping all those perceptions. Um, the stand-up is all about team cohesion once again, coming back. Communication, really listening. I love a stand-up. Sorry, I know the camera's drawing. A stand-up that goes like this. Oh, oh, what? Oh, my turn. Oh, I did Jira number three, four, five. <laughs> That's not a stand-up. It's about actually listening and saying, oh, I didn't know you had that difficulty. How about we come, you know, so it's really about truly being present to help the team and be a cohesive unit. So that takes mindfulness to really be there. Um, a demo or a showcase, whatever you guys call it. I love the it's safe to be wrong. And then the demo, you're sitting there and going, well, no, 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 that's not the way it's going to be. How many of you in the showcase showing to your stakeholders and you fold your hands across your chair and say, no, you don't understand? It's like, no, I don't understand. Really listen to that feedback. That's what it's there for. It's for learning and being wrong, if you are wrong. Hopefully you're not wrong. So acceptance, that that is what's, that's the, the, the feedback, being acceptance and flexible to go with what's next. Retro, well, I don't think we need to talk too much about why mindfulness is needed in a retro. We need that psychological safety. We need to let go of people and stop judging them. Judging. Mindfulness, drop judgment, drop, drop perception, stop projecting. And being humble. I was wrong. I can learn, and I won't be wrong, hopefully next sprint, perhaps. And of course, the user story is all about empathy, true empathy, not what we think. So there's a lot of practices that we connect and bring mindfulness into each of these common agile ways. So it takes someone to just kind of say, stop projecting, stop thinking, stop overthinking, let's come and be clear. So there's a heap of them there. Team interactions, waiting. I love red lights. I know in India we don't have a lot of traffic lights, so this analogy doesn't work. But when I get a red light at home, and believe me, in Australia, in most parts of the world, there are traffic lights everywhere, I celebrate. Yes, I've got a minute to wait and come back. Every red light is a moment for me to come back and become aware again. So when you're waiting for a phone call or a meal or whatever it is that you're waiting for, this is an opportunity, snap yourself back, it's there, great opportunity. Speaking and listening, well, am I really listening? Am I speaking in a way that makes sense to the person listening or am I baffling them with all the jargon, making myself look intelligent and wonderful where they can't even follow me? So speaking needs mindfulness to say, how is the other person hearing this and what do I need them to hear? How can I adjust my way of communicating so they're better able to understand me rather than they should just follow along with all my wonderful bamboozlement. Emails and calls, what are we really trying to do here? Do we really need it? What awareness have we got there? Um, what's available? It's available anywhere, anytime. Just come back to now. Stop traveling backwards and forwards in time and just take any time with a complete awareness, clear your mind. So how will you implement mindfulness? There's a heap of just a couple, and of course there's now volumes and volumes of references. There's some of the ones that I find is my favourite, uh, in particular mindful.org. Um, the Greater Good Berkeley, that's where you can access those 4,000 papers. So, thank you. I hope this has been a useful couple of minutes of your afternoon. Um, have you got time for questions? One minute for a question, if everybody, anybody wants to quickly... I'm still around if people... Yeah, go ahead. Yes, um, the question was, have I actually coached people on mindfulness? So I teach mindfulness, which is a formal thing, but in a, in a corporate environment, when I'm coaching as an agile coach, I will ask people to do mindfulness and coach them through letting go, becoming aware, taking breaths with awareness, and in, in fact, guided meditations if they want, but that's always an optional thing. But in the middle of a sprint plan, are we really seeing things the way we want clearly or are we seeing them through judgments? So yes. 
one on one? Yeah, absolutely. You can. I mean, obviously, mindfulness can only be practiced individually. But if sometimes it needs someone to help you to remember to be mindful, so that's what the mindfulness coaching is: is to getting people to prompt them to come back to be mindful. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. I'm around if anybody wants to come.